it probably won't have escaped the attention of regular viewers that I'm quite fond of old office equipment, like calculators, dictation machines, duplicators, and so on. Well, in a similar area of interest, I also like old typewriters. They're just so satisfying to use with their clack clackety clack soundtrack and lovely mechanical feel. I did a pair of videos a few years ago where I repaired, then demonstrated, this Imperial Good Companion Model 6. I'll put links down in the description. But of course, typewriters evolved over the years. Firstly, there were electrically assisted mechanical typewriters. Then amazing machines like the IBM Golf Ball typewriters and Daisy Wheel typewriters. Then just before computers and word processors became the norm and typewriters became a thing of the past, there was a deluge of feature-packed thermal typewriters like this Casio Writer CW20. The CW20 was made in Japan somewhere around the mid-1980s and has some really exciting features like text editing and memory, adjustable type pitch, type justification and so on. The thermal typewriters also had the advantage of being compact and light, pretty quiet compared to an impact typewriter, and they can run on batteries making them usable off-grid, albeit not to the extent of a mechanical typewriter which needs no power at all. But, in the best traditions of this channel, my CW20 doesn't work. When I first got it, I replaced the dead CR2025 memory battery and installed 4D cells, but when I turned it on it came up with the message RAM dead, reset, and nothing seemed to work. I haven't got a manual for this machine, but I did find one for another model, and it said to turn the machine on while holding down the CMD and margin release keys, which appeared to do the trick, and the message went away. This appears to be some sort of initialization after the batteries are replaced. More significantly than that though, is that the majority of the keyboard isn't working. If I go through the entire keyboard, the only working keys are the margin release, 1, 2, 3, 4, QA, squiggly bracket, semicolon, plus minus, and comma. Hopefully this will be something like a ribbon cable that's partially pulled out. It certainly looks like an issue with the multiplexing of the keyboard, and there's probably only one line of the matrix actually working at the moment. So the first thing to do is open it up and check for the blooming obvious, like a partially unplugged ribbon cable, corroded tracks, or anything like that. Failing that, after a little familiarisation, I'll test for signs of life using the oscilloscope and take it from there. OK, we're in. There's a few ribbon cables to disconnect, but I'll look at the one for the keyboard first. And here it is. Not the usual sort of ribbon cable that has copper strips as the conductor. It looks more like some sort of conductive paint, and where it's been in the connector, the paint has come off and you can see right through it. Then looking at the other end of the cable, the tracks splay out, and I'm thinking that rather than being a ribbon cable connecting the keyboard to the motherboard, this is actually the keyboard contact membrane itself, and if that's damaged somewhere else, there's little chance of fixing it. I've replaced copper ribbon cables in the past by soldering multiple wires in their place, and I could possibly design and get made a PCB to replace the membrane, but the cost would outweigh the value of this machine. I might still be lucky and find something easily fixable, like someone spilt coffee in the keyboard and most of the contacts are dirty, but that seems a little unlikely. I will probe out the end of the keyboard cable before I take the whole thing apart, just in case it's working and the fault lies elsewhere, but my guess is that the fault will be the keyboard membrane. I also did trim the end off the cable and tested the machine again, but still the only keys working were the same few, so that wasn't the problem. Probing the end of the ribbon cable revealed nothing, other than the fact that most of the keys weren't working. So, after removing about one million screws and desoldering the buzzer, I can finally remove the base plate to reveal the keyboard membrane. And on a casual glance, it doesn't look too bad at all. I'll do a few tests, but then I might have to look for something else. Well, I think we found the source of the problem, and it's not good news. If I probe one of the tracks on a key that's working, I get continuity up to the ribbon section, and then something like 500 ohms of resistance at the other end of the ribbon. 
Then if I check one of the other tracks, again I get continuity up to the ribbon section, but there's 1.2k of resistance down at the bottom, so the flexible section isn't in very good shape. If this was an older keyboard with a PCB and traditional ribbon cable, it would be an easy fix. For a quick rundown on how the keyboard should work, there are three layers. The bottom layer, which is actually the top layer when the typewriter is the right way up, has a set of tracks with contact blobs for each key. Also, there are these small contact patches that are held in permanent contact with the top layer to transfer power from one to the other. Then there's the middle layer, which has holes in it, aligned with each contact patch, and this keeps the two layers apart until a key is pressed. And finally the top layer. This has another set of contact patches, but the track layout is different. So when any key is pressed, it connects a unique pair of tracks down to the ribbon end, allowing the processor to know which key has been pressed. It's all very clever and simple, but largely impossible to repair. Right, project update time. I figured, looking at the ribbon cable, that the break was probably at the tight bend formed where the insertion reinforcer ended. So I cut that section off and peeled back the layer of clear film to expose the contacts again and tested continuity. It was still bad. Then, looking through a magnifying glass, it became apparent that the fault was actually at the second bend. That's not so good, because shortening the cable that much would make reinsertion very tricky. But there's nothing to lose, so off came the second section. This time I had continuity, so I've added a new insertion reinforcer, and also a tab from the other side, so hopefully I'll be able to feed it into the connector through what little space is left. So, wish me luck. Well, that took a long time. It was a bit of a pain inserting the cable, but not too bad in the end. However, there were still loads of keys not working. So I stripped everything apart again, and this time cleaned all the contact pads on the membrane sheets, then reassembled the keyboard to try again. And it works! Well, more or less, anyway. There's still a few temperamental keys, like the S key, and I can't get the tab set key to work, so I'll probably do a little more work later, but it's loads better than it was. Anyway, now for a test. Unlike a conventional typewriter, you can do things like bold type, and auto-centralised text, and so on, making it quite fun to use. Typing is just like using a modern computer keyboard, but it takes a bit of getting used to the printhead not doing anything until you get to the end of a line or press return. You can type in direct print mode, but the printhead still lags behind whatever you're typing. You can also store text, up to about 2,500 characters worth, and there's even an expansion slot for additional memory, which I don't have. Compared to a word processor, it isn't that fancy, but if you'd have given me one of these at the time I was using a manual typewriter, I'd have been like, wow, that's amazing! Anyhow, on the basis that the repair took far longer than I expected, I'm going to wrap up the video now. I will take the typewriter apart again in an attempt to fix the tab set button. There's always a chance it could go horribly wrong. But assuming it doesn't, I'll probably make a follow-up video sometime showing some of the hidden features, assuming I can find them. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching and I'll see you in a future video.